This week on Twine Online, Joe Dowds takes us back to Ephesians and looks at Jesus. We are loved, dearly loved children by our Father God. It's that kind of God that places before us this command to live a life of love. World Horizons gives us the opportunity to look at short-term missions. And Rob gets a new hairdo. Well, hello, welcome to Twinem Online. It's good to be back together again uh, today. And uh, well, this is part of what Twinem is doing at the moment. Yeah, we are having uh, church services going on, uh, one church service on a Sunday morning, uh, socially distanced with uh, a maximum of uh, 20 households at the moment. So that's kind of a bit of a challenge. Uh, so for uh, the interim, we're still running uh, these online services. And in the longer term, we're going to be trying to move to live streaming and so that's going to be another challenge for us to face in the weeks ahead so uh, live streaming how do we do that how do we go about doing that so we're, we're working all that through at the moment for those of you who are part of the church this week you will have received infobits which is uh, an elongated uh, news magazine for those who aren't uh, part of the membership or long-term part of the church uh, infobits is a, like a magazine for the church and then there are a couple of things in there that uh, I just want to highlight to the wider church as well. Uh, first one is that we are as I say moving towards live streaming. Live streaming isn't cheap we're trying to raise uh, money for uh, the live streaming. We've got about halfway through uh, the uh, fundraising for that uh, but we've still got to raise uh, a few hundred pounds yet and so we're asking people if they can uh, to donate to the church and to live streaming, uh, the live streaming uh, budget that we have. Um, so if you feel that that's what you'd like to do and you want to obviously uh, uh, help to support uh, the online presence of, uh, of Trinum Church, that's not just for the lockdown, that's, we're going on into the future with that. That we'd love you to, uh, to join with us in supporting that and uh, we're not holding it precious to ourselves in that regard uh, you can do that through the donate button which is well the donate tag underneath here there's a uh, a website connect connection to donate uh, to uh, the church and if you just email me at rob at twinemchurch.org let me know that uh, you want you've sent some money through and that you want it to go to a particular project then uh, then can you just let me know uh, and i can make sure that uh, the finance team uh, get that money, put it in the right account uh, to cover uh, what you've asked it to be donated for. If you're a UK taxpayer and you want to be able to gift aid any donations, when you donate uh, through uh, Church Suite, which is what the administration package we use, secure online uh, package, uh, you can actually click to uh, gift aid and we can get information out to you so that you can sign that off uh, just so that we can collect the uh, tax uh, back from the government uh, that you've already paid. It doesn't cost you anything. It just means the government wants to support charities and that's the way they support charities. So if you want to do that, you absolutely can. Um, if you're unable to give at the moment, you want to be able to give as a church, a long-term church person or a, a, someone visiting the church, you can also just give through uh, through that same um, clicking uh, point. And, but you just don't need to tell me that you want it directed elsewhere. Um, if you go into Donate, there's uh, two projects that you can donate directly into. One's uh, the Link Project, the other one's the General Church Funds. Um, unlike a, a number of churches around, we're not part of a particular denomination. We're an indep independent church, which means that we are entirely uh, we are entirely funded by uh, the generous donations of those who come into the life of the church, which is quite extraordinary, quite amazing. Um, uh, you know, a, an amazing a group of people are part of Twineland Church uh, who make so much of what we do happen through their generosity, through their prayers and through their activity. So uh, it is an amazing church. And if you've not been part of Twineland Church before, you ought to come and see what goes on. It is 
it, it always amazes me. Uh, I'm sure it would amaze you to see all the things that are going on from Acts 435 that we saw last week, that we saw uh, from the recovery course with Emma Heath that we saw three, four weeks ago. Uh, there's lots and lots of things uh, that are, are constantly coming up, going on, uh, out there to assist the community, to reach out to the community, to bring light into dark places. So I uh, just encourage you uh, to get involved with that. Um, the other thing um, on Infobits I just want to highlight to you as well is that we're trying to um, raise funding uh, to uh, create a staff post for uh, a member of staff to, for uh, children's administration and youth leadership. So basically the, the, so it's one post, 25 hours a week, covering children's administration that's the children's work, the uh, 5 to 11's work of the church, just to put together the program that would help the volunteers uh, do, do the stuff, uh, but also to lead the uh, youth work. Um, we're looking to raise about £9,000. That's a shortfall that we have in, uh, in funding that position. If you're, again, if you're able to uh, put money in, you, could, you just need to donate to the church. But I, I'd ask you either today, if you're donating a larger amount, then uh, just um, let me know. Um, if it's a smaller amount and you can do it on a monthly basis, then just give to the church. The church will recognise that. You might want to drop a, a note to either myself or to the finance team. That's finance at Twynham Church. Dot org. That's finance at twinandchurch.org. Um, we're moving quite quickly now into the summer, although you'd never guess it from the weather. Uh, but we're uh, we're moving quite quickly into the summer now, uh, and um, that means that uh, the administration for the church shuts down over the summer. Uh, Sue takes the summer holidays off. It does the same holidays as school holidays. Uh, so uh, at that point, we will be uh, looking at um, moving the phone probably back into the building. Uh, at the moment it gets diverted out um, but we won't have an administrator on site uh, but we will still try to make sure that we're taking your calls uh, so if you're calling in a uh, call on the same number uh, but it should be picked up anyway uh, so uh, that's that ordinary stuff going on seems like it's not ordinary stuff but ordinary stuff uh, perhaps for you but also important stuff for community and connectivity uh, let, letters from the lockdown still going out and hopefully we'll still go out over the summer pray for those who are writing them they're steam coming off of nibs of pens etc uh, off of printers uh, because of the need to write out six or seven weeks worth in one hit so pray for those who are doing the letters from the lockdown if you uh, want to still come on to the cafe that's running over the summer on a Tuesday and a Thursday. I'm going to change the name of it. It is called the Lockdown Cafe at the moment, but we're not particularly locked down anymore. So I might, I might change the name of it. Perhaps we call it the Freedom Cafe. Maybe we'll change it from uh, uh, letters from the lockdown to something else uh, when we get to September. Uh, but uh, so that's that's what we'll do. Um, if you're wanting to come along to church on a Sunday morning, um, it is limited. Uh, it's limited to households. We can have 20 households uh, in the church. So that's 20, 20 individuals or 20 couples or 20 families. But they're or, you know, more often a mixture of those. Uh, we can take up to 60 people in the church, but they have to come in that category of 20 households. Uh, we might later on be able to fit in another couple of households into the church. But at the moment, with the social distancing guidelines we have, it's looking like it's going to be uh, quite widely spaced out. So uh, just, to, just to cover all of those uh, things there. Um, we've got uh, quite a lot uh, to get on with uh, today. Uh, and I've, uh, I was, someone got in touch with uh, the youth uh, Facebook page uh, from World Horizon saying, can we just share a little bit of information and give you a video uh, regarding short-term mission projects? And I thought, actually, youth, well, they'll have it too, but uh, actually the whole church could do is seeing what's going on. So World Horizons uh, is based in Llanelli in Wales, my Welsh accent there, uh, Llanelli uh, in Wales. And uh, you, uh, we, Ali and I, uh, my wife and I, uh, have worked with them before doing member care. Um, and, uh, and been up to their base uh, over there in, in Wales. And uh, we are very impressed with the organisation there. It's a younger church mission, uh, and uh, of, of you know those that are hundreds of years old, younger church mission uh, organisation. But they deal a lot with uh, 
uh, communities out in um, restricted access countries and places they like to try and get to places where nobody else is getting to so uh, let's just watch this video and then we can pray for them uh, and uh, have a time of reading scripture and move on with some worship uh, but uh, let's hand over to world horizons <laughs> Yeah, Father, we thank you for the work that World Horizons do around the world, uh, that they, Lord, uh, they want to reach out into places where Jesus isn't known, uh, that uh, that part of the world, Lord, where uh, Jesus is unknown and uh, and struggles to be made known. And Father, we pray you'll bless them. And, and Lord, if you're calling us to go and be involved and take part in the, in the world of mission, will you just uh, speak into our hearts? and enliven our spirits uh, to know that that's your call on our lives. We, we Lord, want to be a mission-hearted church. We, we want to have eyes that are raised up to you. And Lord, we know that there are many people in our church who have been part of the mission uh, of the church across the world, from Nigeria to Australia um, to uh, Hong Kong and China, right through, Lord, uh, to South America and Peru. Father, we thank you that you... Uh, uh, have sent our church out around the whole world and Lord we ask that you continue to do that so we we bless you Lord and we thank you in Jesus name amen good fantastic so uh, yeah opportunities there with world horizons I'm just going to read to you uh, this is a, a, a passage that's uh, come to my heart in recent days and uh, it's uh, it's it's a uh, a passage that's uh, really spoken to me and I put it into InfoBits again uh, this month and it's from Hosea. Hosea was uh, a prophet in the Old Testament who was called by God to marry a prostitute uh, who was unrepentant in her prostitution and uh, went off and carried on and it, it was a picture really of God's relationship with Israel um, and it says this in chapter 10 and verse well, I've got it tw verse 11b. It starts with Judah. It says this, Judah must plough and Jacob must break up the ground. Sow righteousness for yourselves. Reap the fruit of unfailing love and break up your unploughed ground. For it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteous his righteousness on you. Until he comes and showers his righteousness on you and it was just a it's a passage that struck me it's not one that's not struck me before it has as a similar passage in jeremiah chapter four and uh it's it's the lord uh calling on a nation that's become fallow it's become cool in the presence of god it's it's not pressing on into god and it's not doing the things that god wants to do in fact it's probably doing quite uh, the opposite and it's become infested with weeds and and all sorts of sin that's going on in its life and 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 god calls it to be like a field that needs plowing and it says it says judah must plow jacob which is um another name for judah must break up the ground and uh and i think you know sometimes when we're in lockdown we can find ourselves just saying, oh, you know, we're at home. We can watch watch the service from bed. We can uh, we don't need to get involved in anything. Uh, we can't go out and tell people about Jesus. And then and then it 
it kind of just goes into we can go into a stupor and i'm you know i know in my own life that that that's easy to do it's easy for us just to uh, to to be tired of of trying to do stuff and just to uh, to close down and i think god is calling on us to to put our shoulder to the plow and to push and to and to get involved in people's lives and to really press on and to know um, and to know what uh, God has for us and and it says here in this passage that as we plow the ground and seek the Lord until he comes well we plow the ground and we scatter the seed uh, and and then his righteousness pours out onto us and uh, we're, we're here to to sow righteousness for ourselves and reap the fruit of unfailing love but he's here to pour out his righteousness on us uh, his forgiveness his grace his love but also uh, that overflowing nature of it to our community and to the world at large and, and it just kind of like it challenged me that actually you know it's hard work for some of us it's been perhaps a little less hard work for others that god is calling us to to once again as a church to stand up to get ready to start pushing for god and uh, i just want to challenge i challenge you in that i don't know where you are with your walking god uh, you might be having a fantastic walk with god and i'm not looking to challenge that at all but equally you know sometimes we just we just lose the the heart the, the the hot edge of what god wants to do in our lives that we we go cool we get a bit lukewarm as it says in revelation uh, and we and we can't afford to do that so let's uh just come into a time of just seeking god or just give a give a moment for us perhaps to reflect and just say lord i'm sorry for for what i've not done and then uh, we'll go on and pray but we thank you for this day we thank you lord that we can have this reflection in hosea lord that you are not angry with us you just want us to press on in you you don't want us lord to grow fallow you don't want us to uh to get weedy and covered in briars and nettles and and brambles you want us to be fresh and ready for all that you have for us and lord we need to get up and start plowing our own lives if we're to do that and lord we're sorry for the times when we don't do that in our own lives that we've just allowed ourselves to get fallow and not to receive more from you and help us lord to be ready as we as we begin to gather as we begin to gather together as we be, as we continue to meet online that lord you will not allow us to grow cold but you'll keep us hot for you and all the things that you're planning both for your church here at twynham and for us as individuals and lord also for those who are watching online who perhaps are far away and in different spaces and places or who might equally be um uh, have have fallen away from the church and actually thought I, I do want to come back lord that you're just open for them a, a way back in uh, and and just break up some of the unplowed ground there as well we thank you lord that you are a god who's rich in mercy and that you have unfailing love for us and we ask that you would just bless us now as we come into a place of worship with you in jesus name amen
Ephesians 5 verse 1 and 2 Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Good morning, Twina. It's so nice to be carrying on this um, Ephesians series with you. Um, we've had a break and looked at Daniel and we're back now to Ephesians 5 verses 1 to 2 that will have been read out for you. Just reading from the end of chapter 4, the end of verse 31, Paul writes, Just as in Christ God forgave you, follow God's example therefore as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So the title of my message today is Just As Christ. Just as in Christ God forgave you, 
Follow God's example as dearly loved children and live a life of love. That's the crux of what we'll be looking at today, living a life of love. In 1 John verse 4, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 19, John writes that we love because he first loved us. And that's what frames this command to live a life of love. Will you love as Christ did? That's the challenge that I'd like to unpack this morning. I'm going to use um, a structure that I've picked up from my undergraduate studies, um, a lecturer named Dotha Blackwood. I'm not sure if any of you will have come across her. She's not there at the moment. She's currently at Spurgeon's. But her mantra throughout lots of my lectures was, what kind of God? What kind of God? And so what? And that's the structure I'd like to unpack. This small verse, but really that packs a punch um, with its content. What kind of God are we serving? What kind of God asks us to live a life of love? And so what? What will our response be? How will we live a life of love? So to start then, what kind of God asks us to live a life of love? Well, we have a loving God. In John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. What kind of God asks us to live a life of love? One that so much loved us, that he gave his only son, that we could have eternal life. One that gave his son from heaven down to earth, to humble circumstances. Luke 2 verse 7 writes that she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for him. What kind of God asks us to live a life of love? A kind of God that would send his most precious son into our world, not with majesty and pomp and all the rest, but to a manger, to a young girl, to be immediately rejected because there was no room for them, for this small child to be born, no guest room available. The kind of God that sends his son not only into humble circumstances, into poverty, but into a ministry that is full of suffering and self-sacrifice for each one of us, for you. Isaiah 53 foretells of the kind of death that Jesus' son will die, a criminal's death, to purchase our forgiveness. I'll read Isaiah 53 verses 2 to 6. Such powerful words and it's this kind of God that asks us, commands us to live a life of love. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, says Isaiah 53 verses 2 to six and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem, but surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What kind of God asks us to live a life of love? That kind of God. One that would die a terrible death in our place so that we could have life eternal. We are loved, dearly loved children by our Father God. It's that kind of God that places before us this command to live a life of love. Just as Christ loved us, 
and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, says Ephesians 5 verse 2. Just as Christ. The first question to ask is, can you accept this ex extravagant love? Can you accept this level of self-sacrifice by your Saviour? Because until we receive and accept it, we cannot live it or give it out to anybody else. Just as Christ loved us. So that's the kind of God that I've unpacked a little bit. But so what? What does that mean for us? Okay, there's this loving God. But so what? Well, the command in Ephesians 5 verse 2 is clear. It's simple, but it's not easy. And the command is this, to live a life of love. Jesus also gives this command in John, in chapter 13, shortly before his death to his disciples. And he says in verse 34, a new command I give you, a new command. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So there's that context again. Love one another as I have loved you. Because I love you, so love others. It's interesting that Jesus says it's a new command because surely we know and we understand that God is a loving God throughout all of history, through the Old Testament, despite some common view that, you know, God is angry and fiery in the Old Testament and Jesus is loving in the New Testament. When we unpack those overarching stories, we see that God is a God of love. And not only does he love his own people, but that he blesses and loves them so that they love and bless the other peoples, all peoples, all people groups. Even in the Old Testament, God is commanding us to love Foreigners love those that are outside of our own group, our own circle. There's always that kind of outward looking love. But Jesus says this is a new command to love one another. What, what's new about it? Well, Carson writes that, yes, the command to love God was already known, but Jesus' command to love others carries particular weight because there's a new motivation and scope for that love in light of how Jesus loved them. Jesus came and embodied that love for us. 1 John 2 verses 7 to 11 unpacks this a little bit. Where it says, Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message that you have heard, yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him, that's in Jesus, and in you, in the believers. Because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. So John unpacks that new command that he heard Jesus give however many years earlier. It's old because it has been there since the beginning from God, because of God's love. But it's new because it's embodied in Jesus Christ in the light and life and truth that is in him and in his sacrificial death, in his love for us. He has come and shown us, given us an example of what that love tangibly looks and feels like. And it, that love is in us as believers. So this saving act that Jesus... Um, brings about when he dies on the cross, brings us a new impetus, a whole new dimension of what love and sacrificial love looks like. But it is a missional act. It's not only to respond in love for God, but it's to respond in love for people. Even, Jesus writes elsewhere, for our enemies. One thing to note 
in the Ephesians um, 5 verses 1 to 2 that Paul writes is that forgiveness and love is intrinsically linked here. So when we're thinking about how to put that love into action, what does that look like to live a life of love? Well, Paul notes in this particular passage that just as in Christ God forgave you, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love. And it's about this forgiveness plays an integral part in this living a life of love for others. There's a parable that Jesus tells in Matthew 18 about the unforgiving servant. And I'll tell it now, retell it, because it just puts into perspective what kind of forgiveness we're to show. Peter has asked Jesus, how much should I forgive? We understand that we need to love, that we need to forgive, but how much, where are my limits, where are my boundaries with this forgiveness? And Jesus says, there are no boundaries to your forgiveness. And this is why. He goes on to tell this parable that there is a master who um, has a servant that owes him an unimaginable amount of money. 10,000 talents, the text tells us, in Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. And apparently 10,000 talents is the largest Greek numeral coupled with the largest unit of currency. So it's an unimaginable amount of money that this servant owes this master. And the master brings the servant before him and demands the repayment of the debt and says he'll put his wife and family into prison until he can pay it back. And understandably, the servant falls to his knees and begs for forgiveness, begs for mercy. Please, master, I cannot possibly pay this in my lifetime. Wipe my slate clean. And the master has mercy. The master wipes the servant's slate clean. And we can imagine how we would expect that servant to respond. But what Jesus goes on to describe is that this servant walks out from that encounter with his merciful master and goes straight to another man in the town that owes him the equivalent of three months' wages. So not a small amount, but in comparison with an unimaginable amount, it's a small amount. And the servant... Um, begins to, to strangle the man, to choke the man and says, you owe me three months wages, pay it back now. And the man begs for mercy, for forgiveness. I can't pay it back. Please wipe my slate clean. And the servant says, no, you'll be in prison until you can pay it back. Of course, when the master hears about this, he is disgusted at that servant's behaviour and throws that servant then into prison. And Carson writes that Jesus tells this parable to show that in the light of God's incalculable grace to us, it's ludicrous, as well as wicked, for us to refuse to forgive others. This parable is not told to belittle or trivialise the act of forgiveness. Forgiveness is really, really hard. But it's told in order to put into perspective the forgiveness that we have received. What kind of God? A God that is extravagant with his mercy and grace, that loves without limits, and yes, asks us to do the same. And it's a big ask, but the context, our framework for doing that is to know that we are dearly loved children and that we are forgiven, our slate is wiped clean, that we could never have hoped to pay back to God. We could never have hoped to come close to him in our current humanity. And yet Jesus has made that way. And so in that perspective, Jesus is saying a new command, love one another, forgive without limits. Perhaps you have somebody that needs forgiving Ask God to help you with that. Meditate on his forgiveness for you and allow your heart to be stirred to receive that love and forgiveness that Christ has for you in order that you can begin to take steps to share it with others. But it's always that way round. As we receive, we give. That's the kind of God that asks us to do these things, to live a life of love. 
there's a um, popular writer called Michael Douglas that um, I wouldn't necessarily agree with all his views, um, but he writes persuasively and he comments often insightfully into popular culture at the moment. And one of his recent books, talk, he includes a, a small interlude on social media and on forgiveness. He's not a Christian, um, but he includes this passage on forgiveness and describes cases of um, people not being able to keep their jobs or being offered jobs and then losing their jobs because of things that they may have written on social media, perhaps a year prior, three years ago, five years ago, perhaps things that were written or said 10, 20 years ago, but that have been held in time through media. And he says, he paints a very bleak world without forgiveness. He talks about um, the fact that with the um, death of God that Friedrich Nietzsche pointed out or has prophesied, if you like, in current culture, and with that dies themes of redemption. And he says people are likely to be stuck in spirals of sin and shame and guilt that they cannot get out of because we don't have this overarching theme of redemption. We don't know who will forgive us. We don't know if forgiveness is a thing. It's not a concept often, he says, that he sees in the world and, and he uses those case studies through social media and, and we can see and agree and see that there's some truth in that. So a world without forgiveness is bleak, is dark, where we're stuck in cycles of sin and guilt and shame. But we don't have to be, and as Christians we hold that light um, within us. We can live within that light. We can break free from our own cycles of sin and guilt and shame, and then we can share that with others around us, all out of knowing that we are dearly loved children and that we are forgiven first. We are loved first. We love because he first loved us. So will you forgive just as Christ did? This living a life of love as I summarise now, is, to lo is loving God and responding to him with all our love and it's loving people and responding to them with all our love. That is how pe the world will know that we follow Jesus. That is our missional act and forgiveness is intrinsic to loving. Forgiving others is a, a tangible way of loving them. Will you love just as Christ did? And will you forgive as Jesus does? These commands for Christians are not optional. But we can enact them out of a place of receiving love and forgiveness ourselves. That's the kind of God that asks us to do those things. So how will you respond today? Felix challenged us that mission, uh, last week he challenged us that mission is about moving out of your comfort zone. Don't stay where you are, he was saying. For some of you, in the circumstances that you're in, lockdown will have actually not been at all comfortable. It will have been a very disturbing, painful time for many different reasons. To those people, if that's you, Jesus says, come to me, all who are burdened and weary, and I'll give you rest. Jesus is close to the brokenhearted. That challenge of moving out of your comfort zone is for those only that are feeling comfortable. Perhaps lockdown has been a relatively comfortable season for you. Perhaps, yes, things may have been on hold, but there's been elements of comfort. It's for those of us that find ourselves in that kind of circumstance that Jesus just wants to stir this morning. To step out of your comfort zone and live a life of love that includes forgiveness. Let's see the circumstances around us as an opportunity to shine that light that Jesus himself embodied for us first. Jesus went to the cross. How far will you go in response to him for others? Will you love just as Christ? Thank you so much for um, listening and engaging with me. I'd like to read um, a, uh, there's some lyrics of a song now as, as a a poem and a chance to just give you time to respond 
to digest some of what's been said, to allow Christ to speak into your heart and life, whichever situation you may find yourself in, and to stir us each up into living a life of love just as Christ did. So this song is called My First Love. It's a fairly old song by Stuart Townend, I don't know, 15 years or so. And I'm just going to read the lyrics out as a poem. So please take the time to open your hearts to what Jesus might be wanting to put in there today. My first love. My first love is a blazing fire. I feel his powerful love in me, for he has kindled a flame of passion, and I will let it grow in me. And in the night, I will sing your praise, my love. And in the morning, I will seek your face, my love. And like a child, I will dance in your presence. I'll let the joy of heaven pour down on me. I still remember the first day I met you. And I don't ever want to lose that fire. My first love. My first love is a rushing river, a waterfall that will never cease. And in the torrent of tears and laughter... I feel a healing power released. And I will draw from your well of life, my love, and in your grace, I'll be satisfied, my love. And like a child, I will dance in your presence. I'll let the joy of heaven pour down on me. I still remember the first day I met you and I don't ever want to lose that fire, my first love. Restore the years of the church's slumber. Revive the fire that has grown so dim. Renew the love of those first encounters that we may come alive again and will rise like dawn throughout the earth until the trumpet announces your return. And like a child, I will dance in your presence. I'll let the joy of heaven pour down on me. I still remember the first day I met you. And I don't ever want to lose that fire, my first love. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for that love that you have shown for us. That you have embodied in Jesus Christ that sacrificial love. Lord, help us to receive it and to respond by living a life of love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. Grace is thy faithfulness, O oh 